Welcome to Private Club Radio, the industry's first and only program dedicated to education, news, events, trends and announcements. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. Good to be with you once again here on Private Club Radio. I've got another fantastic guest for you today, especially if you are a GM, you're going to get a lot out of today's episode. My guest today is Miles Tucker, General Manager and Chief Operating Officer of Hillcrest Country Club. Hillcrest is a very special club for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is their oil production. Yes, you heard that right. There's a working oil well right at this club. In addition to the oil, the National Football League is reported to have formed there. And at least eight members of the club have been featured on postage stamps. It's really a unique place, to say the least. Now, beyond history, we're going to discuss what a rebranding really is when it comes to country clubs and what things you should consider when branding or rebranding your club. Here's a hint. It's a whole lot more than a logo. Miles is going to give us his take on the value of effective capital planning and talk about some of the intriguing projects that have taken place at Hillcrest. And imagine a 0% turnover in your kitchen staff over nine months time. At Hillcrest, that was reality. And you'll find out what Miles did to make it happen. All that more when we come back. Are you searching for members? Are you looking to drive revenue to every department of your club? With Course Driver, you can. Course Driver is a custom smartphone application designed specifically for your club. Visit CourseDriver.com to schedule your demo today. This episode of Private Club Radio Show is brought to you by Wildstyle Media, an award-winning media firm and a leader in high-end audio and video production. Wildstyle Media offers full-service media production, post-production, and creative solutions for your company or brand. Contact us today at wildstylemedia.net or call 813-358-6588 today. And welcome back to the show. Before we bring Miles on, just a couple quick announcements for you, some industry events that I think you should be attending. The 2016 Club Membership and Marketing Symposium is going to be held Monday, June 6th from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. at the Isleworth Golf and Country Club in Windermere, Florida. That event is being put on by the Professional Club Marketing Association. You can find out more at askpcma.com. And a heads up, I am going to be participating at the National Club Conference in Chicago, May 19th through the 21st. Would love to have you there. I'm going to have a table for Private Club Radio. We're going to be conducting some live interviews right from the conference. So if you are in Chicago, please come see me. I'd love to speak with you, get you on the show, and get your perspective on where the private club industry is headed. I'm really excited for this conference. It's put on by the National Club Association. They have some interesting education pieces that you're not going to find anyplace else. If you don't know a lot about that organization and really the exciting things they're doing for the entire club industry, I recommend you check them out. Their website's nationalclub.org. All right, without further ado, let's bring on our featured guest, Miles Tucker. Miles is the general manager and chief operating officer of Hillcrest Country Club in the Los Angeles area of California. Miles graduated from one of the top five business schools in the UK. Cardiff Business School with an honorary degree in business administration with hospitality management. Following college, Miles was fortunate to secure a position on the much coveted graduate management training program at the Savoy Group of Hotels and Restaurants. Following an intensive 30 month program that pushed him through every department at some of the most celebrated hotels in the world, he received offers from both of his training properties, Claridge's and the Savoy, along with an offer to become the youngest duty manager in the history of the Connaught Hotel, one of the only hotels to have perpetually maintained a place on Condé Nast's top 10 hotels of the world rankings at the time. He chose the Connaught, and it served him well. Miles, welcome to Private Club Radio. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you guys. First question for you. How did you get from the Connaught over there across the pond to Hillcrest? 
Well, I, uh, I came via Cornell University. Uh, I was fortunate enough to win a scholarship to attend a professional development program, a 12-week summer program at Cornell back in the summer of 2002. And while I was there, I met uh, two people uh, that became very uh, important in my life, one more so than the other, that being my wife, Sadie, uh, who was there on a scholarship herself from Harrah's, the casino company, where she'd worked for 16 years as director of hotel operations, and a gentleman by the name of Jeff Hasley. Um, Jeff is in the club business and uh, was the person who ultimately uh, created the first opportunity for me to move into the club world. So attended Cornell, fell in love. Harris then, when confronted with the choice of losing Sadie or gaining miles, sponsored me into the country. I worked with Harris on mergers and acquisitions and some um, service innovations and brand uh, branding work as they were going through a large M&A process at that point in time. was thoroughly enjoying it, and then Jeff got on the phone and said, would I be interested in becoming the general manager of Green Tree Country Club in Midland, Texas? And uh, I, uh, I decided to take that challenge on and haven't looked back since. Excellent, excellent. Now, you mentioned branding and, and hair, as that probably gave you some experience. Hillcrest, I know, has recently gone through its own rebranding. Uh, what was the impetus to do that? Well, I think really the term that uh, we continue to come back to was relevant. Um, Hillcrest is almost 100 years old has a a very storied reputation for having wonderful food and service, uh, and deservedly so. Uh, It also had a reputation for being quite an old club in terms of more than just the date of incorporation. Um, The membership was ageing. It was the the age-old tale of an ageing membership and uh, facilities that were in need of some attention. And so the club realised in order to become uh, relevant to another generation of club members, uh, there was a need to work through a rebranding effort, and uh, I was lucky enough to play uh, a small part in that. I'm a branding guy, and I'd go so far as to call myself a branding geek, so I get really into this. Um, (laughs) (laughs) What do you want your brand to represent, or what did you want when you were actually crafting the brand for Hillcrest to represent? Well, again, I I, I do come back to that term of relevance, but I think that for us, um, a couple of themes then dominate how how to become relevant. We certainly always want to be considered as a, a luxury brand. Uh, we, we are unapologetic about the fact that we are a bastion of privilege serving the, uh, you pick a number, gave 1%, 0.1% of the community. So it comes with a very high uh, price tag and expectation. So certainly we want our brand to be synonymous with quality and uh, five-star service. More than that, I think one of the core values that really uh, pours through our club is a sense of community. Um, we're, we're a city club with a golf course in many ways, but within our club, we have a very vibrant community of members and team members who uh, all feel very connected to the club. And when we interview prospective members or employees, they're very quickly able to get a sense of, of our culture and the fact that we are a, a community um, here behind the gates uh, in southern Beverly Hills. So we wanted our, our brand to speak to that as well. Um, so really community, quality, uh, five-star service and relevance would be some of the key terms that, that drove our process. It's perfect. And when I talk to my own clients, I always like to say, what are the three adjectives that you describe yourself or that you want to be known for? And so you just did that right there. That's great. Um, do you consider the effort successful and, and to what do you owe the success? Um, yes, uh, very much so. I think that there's some empirical evidence that we can lean on to justify that that statement. First and foremost, our club is now full with a wait list to join the club. Uh, previously, we had a wait list to lead the club. Um, that is obviously, I would suggest, a KPI for any, any private club Absolutely. in America or throughout the world. Is there a demand for the product that you're offering? And, and the answer for us is a resounding yes. What has also happened is the average age of our new members in the last three and a half years has actually been at just under 50. Uh, It's in the 49.8 the last time I looked at it, which has brought our overall population average down into the mid to high 60s for the first time. It's under 70 since we started tracking that data. So the clubs become younger, more popular, top line growth is uh, off the charts. And 
I'm much more of a top line manager than the bottom line manager. I'm very focused on the experience. Um, my management team will tell you I do not rake them over the coals at cost center reviews or um, during the budgeting process. I feel it's my job to procure the resources they need to be successful at delivering the experience that we want to be known for and synonymous with. And uh, we've had a, a bunch of new facilities that have come on stream to great fanfare and review, but arguably more importantly, the programming that's gone in around those facilities and the service enhancements that we've looked to make in all areas of our business as a management team have really, I think, put winded ourselves to the point where we've got an incredibly happy, and I would go as far as to say very proud membership. And that's really what we were looking for, is we wanted the members to have a tremendous sense of pride uh, that we share with them as, as staff about this wonderful, wonderful, singularly unique club here on the uh, West Coast. It is a real gem. You alluded to it with the word programming, but I, I think there's a misconception out there that when when a club goes through a rebrand, they're changing their logo and they, they change their colors, and to them that's a rebrand. I think a lot of businesses have that misconception. So for you, Miles, what went into the actual rebrand? What were the different elements or the different phases of your rebrand? Well, to sort of be specific to to programming and to tie back again to the experiential focus that we have here, I'll walk you through um, an example of something we did at the very beginning as a management team to try and ensure that we were going to be recognized as one of the leading clubs in the world, which we had the stuff, as Greg would say. Mm -hmm. Um, Now we needed to have the people and the vibe. And so we all convened the management team and I at our main entrance on Pico Boulevard one Friday afternoon and uh, divided into teams. And we walked through the club experience as a member would for the first time going into the different areas of our clubs. So we divided into four teams, a golf team, a tennis team, a food and beverage team, and a pool team. And the, the, the remit then as we were walking through was to look for consistency in terms of interactions with staff, in terms of language use, in terms of appearance of staff, in terms of appearance of the environments that we were entering. We'd already articulated our presentation standards. So it was a, a, a a testing of those standards, not to put too fine a point on it. And what we were unbearably focused on, though, beyond uniforms and logos and presentations and amenitization, was the interactions. Um, We wanted to understand how staff were interacting with people at the club and vice versa. Um, So we then spent a considerable amount of time scripting certain interactions Um, So, for example, one of our standards now is that a guest who comes to play golf at Hillcrest will hear their name used no fewer than four times. Um, That is a brand standard that we have at the club. It's very measurable for me. It's something that creates a tremendous point of differentiation over most anywhere else, I would suggest. Um, And obviously, the members are thrilled to be being lauded on the practice tee about how on earth did the locker room guys know my name and have a locker waiting for me and why was the golf cart at the bottom of the stairs did you do that for me jack wow (laughs) to which to which jack says "Ah, it's it's just just hillcrest that's how we do (laughs) sure (laughs) and uh so we're, we're thrilled that they're able to bask in that reflected glory so it's specific to programming um it's i think the your brand ambassadors are your frontline staff, right? Um, I can I can beat the drum in the boardroom and, and we can have a great understanding of, of what we want our brand to be synonymous with. But the people that will define our brand are the frontline service people in that moment of truth, in that interaction with that member or guest, particularly on those first few interactions. So we put a really heavy focus on understanding that And obviously, then engaging the people, because as your listeners will have heard, I've got a really strange and exotic, if you're feeling uh, favorable towards me, accent. So it would be unsurprising for you to learn that when I'm scripting the arrival experience at Hillcrest, it's probably not going to sound natural to my uh, employee that's actually going to deliver that message. So then it's a a collaboration between us all as to what's the right language to use because I need it to be repeatable. Um, I need it to be something that I know it's going to come out the same way every single time because greatness in service and at the luxury end of the market is all about consistency. 
Oh, that's that's so true. There's some great wisdom in, in, in that. I think a name is the sweetest thing that to anyone's ears. I, I, I know back long time ago, AT&T did a survey and uh, I think the word I was used more than anything else. But, but it's such an impersonal world now that when you can add that personal touch, it just goes such a long way. And um, wow, I'm very impressed. Well, let's talk capital planning. Tell us about the value of capital planning and doing that effectively. Well, there, there is a jump off point on this for me, um, which is that you have to bifurcate your operating and capital budgets. You have to have the discipline as a business leader to understand your long term capital needs and to understand how you're going to finance those long term capital needs. And that needs to be not a separate conversation to your operational platform, um, but it needs to be understood that it's a completely separate entity in and of its own right. So we um, we work long and hard with the board in the first year to help right size the financial model and to bifurcate those uh, those those budgets so that we have three primary uh, cap sources of capital income. One is the transfer fee from memberships as they get sold. The second is a monthly or annual capital fee that's built to the members. And the third is um, uh, oil revenues, because surely every club has an oil well, right, Dave? <laughs> yeah, right. Tell, <laughs> tell us about that. I was reading that in Wikipedia. Well, I'd, I'd strongly recommend you get one. They're fabulous. <laughs> um, yes, no, Hillcrest, uh, Hillcrest has, an, has a, an oil operation that dates back to the 1950s. Um, it is a, it, it's an interview in its own right, my friend. Uh, the, the, the history, the stories the tales that have erupted from that area of our operation and the incredible opportunities and challenges it presents for us moving forward. Um, there's a type I of membership called BO, that. right? Before oil. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. There's an element of that that's, that remains true. Yes. And they do continue to sort of bequeath their oil rights, which are worth next to nothing. Um, <laughs> well, with gas another, prices now. Yeah. It's not comical. good. Yeah. It's somewhat comical to be perfectly honest with you, but it's, um, no, it's what was really ironic is there was a period of time at Hillcrest where a member would have received a, a statement that would have said something along the lines of uh, dues and fees, $2.50, food and beverage expenditures, 75 cents, oil revenues, $4.50. Here's your check for 25 cents. And I, I apologize, I wasn't tracking my numbers there. So someone's going to probably call in and tell you that I can't do math. Um, but yes, there was a time where members were actually getting uh, the benefit of the club and a check because of the revenues coming from the oil back in the 50s. So that wow. was very cool. Perhaps a misappropriation of funds as my legal committee and I would see it now. <laughs> sure. But um, hey, and that's the great thing about these 100-year-old clubs. They are chocker full of wonderful stories like that. And right. uh, I'm, I'm, I, the older I get, the more of a history buff I become. And so for a number of reasons, Hillcrest probably uh, over the course of history has hit its light under a bit of a bushel. Um, the history here has not been celebrated to the extent that it would have typically been at another club. Mm -hmm. I won't get into the personal opinions I have as to why that may have been. I'm, I'm sure your uh, listeners will connect the dots if they know a little bit about the club. But um, for, as a, for example, did anyone out there know that Hillcrest was the first club to host a major championship on the West Coast of America? Probably not. Um, we hosted the 1929 PGA Championship. In 1948, the members of Hillcrest raised $2.2 million for the foundation of the State of Israel. Um, back then, gave $2.8 million with some real coin, you know? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's off a member base of 350. So uh, the NFL was reported to have been formed in a dining room. Um, we have wow. eight members of Hillcrest that have been recognized with their own U.S. postage stamp, we found out. Oh, my goodness. And as a limey, there's only one person that gets on the stamp back home. So that was a big deal. Um, so we've managed to track down those stamps and bring them out. Because, again, when you talk about our brand and our brand having a sense of community, we have to understand where we came from. And we have to have a, a disproportionate sense of pride about all the wonderful things that have taken place here and that we've been central to. Um, oil kind of dovetails into that, uh, an amusing story. We um, enlarged our patio. We can now sit about 150 people outside for our fresco dining at lunch and dinner, and uh, it is packed uh, most every day that the weather's above 75. 
So they started to remove some trees so that we could see downtown from the patio. And then they realized between the patio and downtown is the oil well. So immediately stopped, leave the trees, try and hide the oil well. And that's something we're working through now is to say there's nothing to be ashamed of. We should paint that thing. We should upline it. We should have Greg Patterson come and jump out of the plane and <laughs> land on it and help me with a ribbon cutting. Right. We should build a bar over there called Derrick's and we should celebrate it. We should celebrate that singularly unique piece of our club history. Um, and so as we build the you know, energy and community and, and part of the the magic that's happened here, as we brought in all of these young families in their 40s, we haven't lost a single member except to the big man upstairs. Um, we, we've really made sure that everyone coming in and everyone already here understands how we got to be where we are today and the debt of gratitude we owe to our predecessors. And I think that's incredibly important if you're going to try and create some sense of community and forward thinking. Well, speaking of building bars called Derrick's, I like that, by the way. <laughs> what sort of other facilities excite existing members and attract new ones? So we've done some really great things, and I have to sort of give some uh, props to my club management community in particular, Bill Howard, who uh, is over at the Bel Air Bay Club, who and Larry Marks, who was up at Diablo and is now over at Bell Reef. They both helped me with uh, bocce, understanding the value of bocce, how to put a bocce program together and to get bocce courts at Hillcrest. Um, I will tell you it was not on the front end something that everyone universally thought was a great idea. In one week of opening the bocce courts, we had 88 members signed up in our bocce league. Wow. At the first two weeks of bocce play, when it was just open play and teaching people the game, we had people, we had kids out there, teenagers, people in their twenties, all the way through to a couple of nonagenarian grandparents coming out and chucking a big ball at a little ball while enjoying a drink. And who wouldn't, you know? So um, that was fantastic. Uh, recently, had my friend David Smith out here, and he's encouraging me to put in some uh, foot golf as well in that location, which I think is a tremendous idea for my younger members. Mm-hmm. Um, a big chapeau to Matthew Walnut at the Jonathan Club, who's really the, uh, and in fairness, Kirk Reese, uh, formerly of LACC, both of whom have done some significant work on urban farming in LA. Um, we took their uh, best ideas and made them better. Uh, I don't feel shy about saying that, having, particularly having given them their props. But we built an urban farm here uh, 15 months ago. It has 4,800 square feet of uh, planting space. That's 100 raised beds, uh, 12 feet by 4 feet with drip irrigation, 55 fruit trees in the orchard, which won't really come to fruition uh, until probably 2018. Uh, we're just putting in beehives. We're going to put in beehives in the next uh, couple of months. Wow! And the goal is we have a, we're already using the produce. The members are ecstatic about it. We're doing farms table in a way that no one else can um, because it's grown here. It comes out of the ground here. It's served at lunch. It's it's unbelievable. Um, and, and a little sidebar anecdote about that project that I'm very proud of and, and intrigued by, and it's a supposition on my part. We had a window of time after the urban farm opened where we had 0% turnover in our kitchen for nine months. Oh, my goodness. 0% turnover in our kitchen for nine months. I, as you mentioned, I've worked at some great places and with some great people. I've never seen a statistic like that. And in my estimation, the farm is why that happened because you would see fleets of cooks heading over with the sous chefs to go and look at the farm to see what was being planted. When the produce comes in from the farm, they ring the bell, everyone has to stop what they're doing, everyone comes around, everyone looks at the produce, everyone tastes the produce, they start brainstorming on specials for the day. Nice. And so too many people are just put to work, right? And particularly in a kitchen environment, that's your section, go do it, do it until you fall over and go home and come back and do the same for me again tomorrow. By actually educating our staff and having them have a, a, an understanding of the ingredients from source, from seed, not to put too fine on it, the, the efforts we made to source some amazing produce that no one else can get for hundreds of miles, it got them excited, it got them interested, and they, they then had an opportunity to get involved with not just seeing it and touching it and tasting it, but then collaborating with the chefs and the culinary team on the specials and how to utilize those ingredients. So just it created a real groundswell of, of learning and passion and energy 
um, which inevitably bleeds through into the members. Sure. The, the, the food service staff are then brought in and they're allowed to taste it and talk. and blah, blah. So then they're espousing it to the guests in the grill room in a way that we had never been able to anticipate, to be honest. And uh, again, we, from a branding standpoint, right, we have always been known for having great food at Hillcrest. And most of the time that's been deserved. And now, boy, oh boy, is it deserved. Now we've taken that, we've developed that, we've enhanced it, we've put the farm in, we have other strategies in mind for the future to continue to really uh, innovate and pioneer and create delight and excitement for our members um, in our food programs. And uh, that was just awesome. So another little anecdote on that, when we do the kids' camps, we'll let the kids go over there at the beginning of the summer camp season. We keep a couple of beds. They all go in. They get their hands dirty. They plant things. They put their lollipop sticks in with their names <laughs> on it. And at cool. the end of the season, they come back and they harvest those ingredients with their parents and take wow. it home. What and we sold two memberships on the back end of the farm where, where mums came in and said, can I bring my kids down here and show them this? Absolutely, oh, wow. ma'am. And this is how the summer camp thing works. Nice. Um, because sustainability is something which I feel uh, wow. we have a responsibility as an industry to take a leadership role. Now, you said that you have exceptionally low turnover with the uh, kitchen staff, but really you have that throughout the entire club. So what do you, you attribute that to? Well, I mean, I think that uh, it's a, it starts with the fact it's a great place to work. It really is. Um, I, I meet every prospective employee before they're sent off for their drug test. And the way I explain things to them is I tell them that it's, I call it the circle of love. Our members have extra, I ask them if they know how much it costs to join the club. Most often they don't. I share with them that currently it's $205,000 and I say to them, can you ever imagine writing a check for that amount for anything other than a roof over your head? Mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, with that kind of financial investment comes a very high expectation of service Certainly. and of care from us to them. But what's unique about Hillcrest is that when you meet that standard, you're thanked, you're recognized, and you're rewarded. And that applies to the dishwasher all the way through to me, and it's a function of our member community. I, I'd love to take more credit for it, but it really is a function of the members and the core values of this club. Um, we One of the things we did last year, which I'm extremely proud of, is we put in place an employee scholarship fund. Excellent. And I was actually interviewing a guy yesterday and he was talking to me about that program and asked me, what's the best thing about your job? I said, the best thing about my job is I have an opportunity to connect the dots for people. I have, an, I have 230 people that work for me. Over 100 of them have multiple jobs, take multiple buses to get to work and have needs that are completely foreign to my member base. But I have a member base that cares desperately. Uh, part of the uh, core values of Hillcrest is community and giving back. And if you're not a charitable individual, you won't get into our club. So I have a group of members on the one hand who are have good resources to put to bear, care desperately about the world that they live in, love the staff here, appreciate the work they do for them every day. I have a team of staff that love working here, think the world of the members and need their help. And so I was sharing with this young man that when we put this program together, as excited as I was to have employees come into my office with their children and grandchildren in tears, thanking us for everything we'd done, it was every bit as heartwarming to have committee members coming out of those meetings in tears saying, I cannot believe what I just heard in there. And all this young lady needs is $87.50 a week to help her with gas and parking. And can you believe it? And it doesn't qualify her for the program, but I really want to help her. And how can I do that? Wow. What a great opportunity to, to connect. And it's a win-win. It truly is a win-win. Both sides of that transaction are enriched from the experience. So, um, a really unique opportunity to sit at the fulcrum of that sort of pyramid, if you like, and help to connect those dots for people. Just a huge, huge opportunity. If a club doesn't have that sort of culture already, 
I know you've been very humble and you said it's sort of been there, but I'm sure you have a lot to do with it. What would be your tips to other managers out there to sort of build that culture into their club or get the ball rolling with, with building a culture like that? I, I will tell you that not every club I've managed has been as uh, forward thinking as Hillcrest in that regard. And as you were asking the question, Gabe, I, I fell back on a document, which I consider to be, you know, my, uh, my service Bible is the service profit chain. It was first published in the Harvard Business Review back in the 90s. And it talks about the fact that everything starts with how we treat each other as a team of staff, our internal customer service, how how we treat one another will define the ultimate experience. And I believe that passionately. So if I'm going to try and affect a cultural revolution, I'm starting with my team. Um, I'll give you an example. I managed a club in the Midwest and um, found out about a charity called St. Baldrick's, uh, which supports children's cancer research. It was started by the Fire Department of New York. Uh, basically, what happens is people get pledges to shave their heads completely bald. Oh, wow. Um, and they then shave their heads completely bald and they send their pledge money in. And the idea is that in addition to raising the funds, it increases awareness of how people treat you differently if you're wearing a bandana or your head's been shaved, because they will assume that you have gone through chemotherapy. Right. Um, it's just a great cause, um, something that really spoke to me. So I shared that with my with my management team and, and then with a broader team of staff. And at no point can you shoehorn someone into that kind of activity. It either speaks to them or it doesn't. Uh, there were 11 employees at the club, um, from my assistant manager down to... Um, food servers and runners who all said, I'd love to do that. I would love to do that. What a great opportunity to do something good in the world. Count me in, count me in, let's do it. I then spoke to my predecessor um, and conceived this concept whereby we actually had a live auction of our noggins. So oh, wow. I brought in <laughs> my predecessor, the previous GM, who's not quite as colorful as Patterson, but he wasn't too far <laughs> off of it. And he'd been there for 10 years. He knew everybody. Everybody loved him. So he knew how to press people's buttons and he knew where the fat wallets were in the room. Mm -hmm. So he came in to help me. He was the auctioneer. He knew the staff as well. So he auctioned off the heads. Um, one, the, the highlight of the night was when a young lady who had beautiful hair, something that I will never have, who agreed <laughs> to do it, but had then got buyer's remorse. One of the members stood up and said, I've got 2,500 bucks for Susie to keep her hair. To which everyone gave a big round of applause and Susie kept her hair. Wow. And I was the last one, so I went up and I said, I've got a grand to keep my hair. And uh, my best friend at that club stood up and said, that's never going to be enough. 1500 it goes, it goes, it goes. So we raised, I think, about $30,000 that night for an incredible cause. But again, we, we built community. Yeah. And from that, we then were in the newspaper, uh, not through any design, just we just were. That then caused the American Cancer Society to call me up and say, we've been looking to put a Relay for Life on in that community. Would you help? To which I say, yes, of course, I'll help. Um, and then I can, again, leverage my network. I know who I've got in my um, staff team that's committed to things like that. I know which members showed up that were willing to drop cash to support that event. I can reach out to my vendors. And so organically and, and a coalition of the willing just starts to develop. And we then, we started the Relay for Life in Juneland. We did three before I uh, moved on to my next professional opportunity. I think we raised about half a million dollars cumulatively. Um, so just wow. a great source of pride. But what I would say is don't, don't, don't try and fake that one. It either sure. speaks to you and you want it. And in which case nothing's going to stop you from being successful with it. And you'll get the right people on the bus with you or you don't. And that, that's fine too. Sure. Yeah. Well, I like the idea of, of, of getting that interaction between the staff and the members themselves and really, you know, almost forming, you know, a third team of, of the combination of the two. I think that's a great point you made. Another question for you before we wrap up. Board governance and club governance in a club steeped in history like yours, you've been you've been around for over 100 years. How has your governance model changed? Dramatically. Um, I, uh, it would be fair to say that Hillcrest had a reputation of being run by its committees. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was eyes wide open to that when I came in here, and I was also very direct in my 
um, expectations with regards to the governance model that we would implement and the organizational structure that we would enjoy. And it's, it, hey, look, it's a, it's a big ship. It's a slow turn. So you don't shake a stick and it turns overnight. Right. But we made some big changes early. Um, one of the big differences between me and Greg is our outlook on committees. Um, Greg, as, as you will know, would, if he could spend his entire life rolling from one committee meeting to the next, coming up for air and to type up minutes, he would be in heaven. Um, I would be in the other location. Um, we have over 20 committees here. They're all incredibly valuable. They provide great insight. I'm very lucky to have them. They're always oversubscribed. The members here care passionately about their club. There is nothing that we will ever do to damage that. Um, that is just so important to maintain that energy. At the same time, a committee is there to make recommendations to a higher authority, which is the board. So there is no need for me to be at committee meetings. If I am at committee meetings, there is a different level of expectation that decisions will get made in that arena. Mm -hmm. That is not what the committee is there to do. So the first thing we did was we said, Miles isn't going to committees, the department heads will go to committees, which has been a great development opportunity for them. Sure. It's created a much better alignment, again, between managers and committees, and they're able to execute things when approved in a much more seamless fashion. But the urban farm would be a great example of how a committee process should work. Um, and we can come back to that if you like. But the so the bottom line was by pulling myself and the president out of committee meetings and only having us attend the board meeting, that meant that the committee reporting process started to function properly. Um, and committees would then make recommendations to boards and boards would either approve them or not and there would be discussion at the right level uh, before changes were made just by creating that vacuum of that vacuum of time where something's coming out of committee my manager's sharing it with me the next day i've got a minimum of eight days until the board meeting to discuss it with my president the executive committee we all know what's coming out of them and we have a good sense of how it's going to end that has made things so much smoother in terms of the day-to-day -day operation of the club it's made so much easier for the managers to take instruction from one source instead of three. And it's allowed us then to take it to the next level, which is to talk about what the board really needs to be doing, which is strategic planning. And to say to them, we've got to back away from these things. We've got to look further down the track as to what we want to be and how we're going to get there. We've built our financial models that we can now play with to ensure that we can fund any wild and crazy ideas we have. We've set the budgets up in a way that all of our deferred maintenance needs are going to be taken care of. Your carpets are never going to look shabby. Your chairs are always going to be immaculate. And there's enough sort of gravy over here as well that you can have a wild and crazy idea every year and try and do something different and just try something. Try a bocce court. See if right. it works. If it doesn't, all right, that's 50 grand down the sink. Such is life, uh, uh, an operation of this size. And doing that allows them to continue to feel that they have a real hand on where that money's being spent and how it's being spent. Three million a year is already spoken to. You've got, you know, 300 grand left over here to monkey around with. Right. Um, so I think that, that has, they, they have been the big, uh, the big shifts there. And now it's a case of backfilling it because we were kind of building the car as we were driving it. So now it's about the administration. Um, now it's about making sure that every committee has a purpose and process statement. Every committee has a formal orientation process. It has a quali candidate qualification criteria to get on the committee. And from that, once we've got those things in place, then it's a case of bringing committees together to share bigger visions with them and ultimately for those committees to act as the proving ground for future board members. So there's tons of the industry's done an amazing job of laying these things out for people it's hard to get it done um i think one of the things that leaves me with great hope and that has given me the opportunity to be successful with that here is the way the terms of service work so a board member serves typically for two consecutive three-year terms and a president serves for two years typically the second and third year of their second term so if you've been involved in committees for a couple of years before you get onto the board, by the time you're the president, you're 10 years in here. Right. You get it. You get sure. us. You know us. Um, I knew when I was hired who my boss was going to be two years from now. Right. 
to a very large extent, I knew that, and it's played out that way. So that consistency allows me opportunities that I know a lot of other club managers don't have. So I think if I was going to offer advice to someone that didn't have it, the first thing is right-size your board and get the right term limits in place so there can be some form of succession planning. Great advice, and that's how businesses run in the real world outside of clubs, right? <laughs> so right, why not yeah. run a run a club like a business? <laughs> All right. Um, okay, this is kind of an, uh, a curveball question, just something that popped in my mind. So I'm going to ask it, and we'll see what comes out. If you had a hundred thousand dollars in your budget left over somehow, some way, spare hundred thousand, how would you use it? What would you invest in? Oh. <sighs> I mean, I, um, I, I just want to say staff. Um, I, I really do. Um, and I'm always challenging uh, the management team to think about how we can do more for the staff. Because of what I said earlier, I just fervently believe that the, the member service our members are going to ultimately enjoy and their guests are going to enjoy it are going to be determined by the way we treat the staff and we treat one another. Mm-hmm. So a hundred thousand dollars is, you know, it, 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 in terms of Greg Patterson speak, that's quite a lot of stuff, <laughs> but that stuff probably isn't going to change a whole lot, is it? Right. So I think that I would find ways to funnel that back towards the employee base. And I will tell you how I would do that now that I've had a time to buy a chance to buy myself. Some time. <laughs> we had uh, a member donate courtside tickets to the Lakers for our employee holiday party. And unfortunately, they didn't get given out in the raffle. So we found them and we said, well, I'm not going to do a lucky seat at the safety meeting. It's We're going to have an idea for whoever comes up with an idea to improve the club for the members or the staff wins two courtside tickets for the Lakers. Nice. Face value of six grand or whatever. Sure. Um, it was my executive housekeeper who's been with us for over 30 years, who's someone I'm very, very proud of. Um, she's been fabulous. She's learned so many new things and shown a great attitude to learning. So I was very pleased that she won this contest. And Teresa's idea was we're, um, for anyone that's not familiar with Los Angeles, it's a nightmare to drive through, period, the end. There's no mass transit. They're starting to work on that now. Most of my staff live in East Los Angeles. Our club is on the west side. Goodness. There is a rail link that is going to be coming in from the east side to a station that's about three quarters of a mile from the club. And what my housekeeper said to me was, you need to find a way to introduce a shuttle service that will allow the staff to get off the train, get picked up, brought to the club. And when they finish, take, take them back to that station. I need you to expand the bus pass reimbursement program to include rail travel. And I think if you did that, you'd improve the environment. You'd shorten the employees' commute times. You'd give them more time with their family. And you'd give us you know, a really cool competitive advantage. That's a... And I sat there and I was like, they're the ideas I like, the ones that I can't wave a wand at and that really challenge me and my team. How can we make that happen? Right. Um, so one of the things I have done with that is I've met with the other general managers of the clubs on the west side to see if they would be interested in sharing in that kind of um, uh, a service because it would be surely easier to afford for four clubs sure. and the service and the concept would remain unchanged. Um, one of them said something that I thought was very cute, which was that um, you're further up Maslow's hierarchy of needs than us. <laughs> so <laughs> we've got other things to worry about at sure. the moment, which I thought was great. But so 100 grand, I'm going to go and buy, probably going to go and buy a shuttle bus and uh, boost up my insurance and start to find a way to get my staff to the club um, with less money, less time, and less environmental consequence. Oh, well, maybe all you have to do is shave a few heads. You might be able to get there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome answer. I mean, it's clear you you put the value in your people, and that's why you have such low turnover. That's why you have such high satisfaction and not only low turnover in the staff, but in the membership. So just excellent advice. I really appreciate that, Miles. Last question for you. It's the bucket list question. You, of course, manage one of the most prestigious clubs in the country. I'm sure you visited other clubs along the way. What would be on your bucket list, Miles? Well, um, as a global citizen, Gabe, um, I recently took one off of my list, which was Royal Melbourne, um, which is arguably my favorite golf course now on planet Earth. I just loved it. Um, In thinking about 
you know, the globalization of our industry as well as every other industry and the fact that I do consider myself a global citizen. One of the places I'm hankering after a visit to is Mission Hills in Shenzhen. Okay, yep. I just think that would be fascinating to see uh, an operation on that size, that scale of operation. I think that would be fascinating. Um, I, there's a there's one much more locally, which I'm just desperate to get into at some point. Are you familiar with Club 33 at Disney? I not. Nah, tell me about it. So LA has got some of the coolest clubs anywhere in the world. Not only the Beach Club at Santa Monica, of course, and uh, the Jonathan Club and Los Angeles Country Club and Bel Air and all these iconic institutions. We've got places like the Magic Castle, which is managed by a great guy, Joe Furlow. The Magic Castle, if you haven't been to LA, you've got to go and see it. It's literally uh, where all the magicians belong wow and so it's a you know they've got six different theaters with music with um magic going on all day every day houdini was a member there etc etc wow. it's just cool that is cool um, another one that kind of tips my hat like that is club 33 at disney so rumor has it then when walt disney built the park he wanted to have somewhere, somewhere to be able to entertain his guests and those kinds of things where they could actually enjoy a couple of fingers of scotch. Um, and so there's a club there called Club 33. It's in the heart of New Orleans Square. Huh. Um, you can't even see it. It's a very secret sort of entrance. But to me, it speaks of exactly what a private club should sure. be. It's yeah. like right in the middle of Disneyland, for goodness <laughs> sake. No one even knows it's there, and you can drink a cold beer. Come on, wow. Gabe. It doesn't get any better than that. Oh get goodness. away from the Pirates of the Caribbean and go and have a beer with an adult at Disney. That just <laughs> has huge appeal to me. That's so awesome. I would put that one on there. And then I am a, I am a golfer. Uh, I am living on the West Coast. I have a birthday of significance coming up. And uh, my hope is that I can get up to Cypress Point this uh, this summer because, again, that's just, uh, as a golfer, that's a pretty pretty hallowed turf right now. Wow. So you're turning 30, huh, Miles? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the first digit changes, but it's higher than a three. <laughs> <laughs> We'll let, the, we'll let the listeners do the math on that one. It was such a pleasure. How do folks reach out to you or how do they get more information if, if they have questions? How should folks reach out, Miles? Oh, okay. If ever I can be of help to anyone out there, I'm always happy to do it. I've got my, obviously, my CMAA email address. I've got an email address at Hillcrest, which you can find through their website. Uh, and I'm also on LinkedIn and uh, increasingly use that more and more now. Um, and I uh, can't thank you enough for giving me a chance to, to speak with you today. I've, I've enjoyed it very much. If you enjoyed Miles as much as I did, reach out to Greg Patterson and say thank you. Greg on episode 11 gave us Miles' name as one of the general managers that was really doing things right. And as you heard, he was absolutely 100% correct. That's the cool thing about this show. A lot of our guests come from folks just like you who let us know about an intriguing story or someone in the club industry that we just have to pick their brain. Check out Private Club Radio, and you can submit who you think would be a great guest on this show as well. We want to tell those stories right here on Private Club Radio and share them with the world. While you're at Private Club Radio, don't forget to subscribe. That way this show is on your mobile phone each and every Monday just waiting for you. If you are an iPhone user, simply go to privateclubradio.com slash iTunes. And if you're an Android user, go to privateclubradio.com slash Android. And when you go to those sites on your phone, it'll take you right to the streaming services where you can subscribe and get each and every episode Monday mornings right on your phone. You're going to want to come back every week, especially next week when we speak with Ray Cronin and Russ Condi of Club Benchmarking. They are a company providing data to the private club industry unlike anyone else. And it's going to be a pretty exciting show. Wishing you a very happy and stress-free work week at your club. And until next time, here's to your membership success. Just because this round is over doesn't mean you can't enjoy the 19th hole. Check out privateclubradio.com for more. Private Club Radio is brought to you by Shake Creative, the premier marketing and design firm helping prestigious clubs increase and retain their membership. 
visit shaketampa.com to learn more.